Good morning and welcome to another edition of the podcast. Hello, how are you today? I'm your host, Mitch Corbett. Uh, you can find me at Neverful Mitchie on Instagram and Twitter. And this week we have two uh, great guests. They are uh, they're united in marriage as well as united in business together. I'm talking about my friend uh, Quinn Aiden Corkill and uh, Jessica Jean Marie. Um, so I know Quinn from college. Uh, we played golf together a bunch of times while we were there, and uh, we've kept our friendship going through the years. Uh, Jessica is his partner, um, and they just recently, um, with her artistic background, started working together uh, professionally. So we delve into the idea of like the moment in time where they kind of decide to become partners, both professionally and in a, a romantic sense, I guess. Um, and we talk about their evolution as individual artists, um, with Jessica being a makeup artist, um, a musician, and I do believe just an uh, artist of a visual, a visual artist, whereas Quinn is more my job, which is like TV uh, freelance based sort of thing. He has his own business and everything. So we, we kind of delve into a little bit of everything uh, with this episode. So you guys, I hope you guys enjoy this episode with uh, Quinn Corkle and Jessica Jean Marie. All right, uh, Quinn Corkle and Jessica Hayner, welcome to the podcast. Hello, how are you today? Uh, thanks for joining me. Now, uh, Quinn, you know the podcast name. Hey, we thought you were asking us how we're doing, I was but say, I had to remind her. That's, oh, that's part of the intro, right? That's <laughs> what it's called. It's called "Hello, How Are You Today." Yeah, that's part. Of the I didn't. Intro. I didn't tell you her that. A bit, Quinn. You fucked up a bit. <laughs> sorry, Fox. Sorry. Can I explain Fox, the yeah. joke. Too? Start again. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're leaving it. In. We're leaving it. In. Um, so I wanted you guys to have you on the podcast because um, Quinn, I've known you for a long time. Uh, we got we went to school together. Um, and you two have formed this partnership where you're both uh, um, partners in business, but also partners in um, real life. I was going to say the bedroom, but that's inappropriate. Um, <laughs> Quite. Not wrong. I mean, it's, it's not, not wrong. wrong. That's so fair. Let's, uh, let's start with you, Quinn, uh, because you both had your own stories to tell before this. Um, after you grad- graduated college, did you go straight into making your uh, own freelance business or did you try working around for a bit? Because... You and I both went and graduated the uh, television, film, and uh, radio program at uh, Niagara College. Yeah. Um, I So, as you know, we had to do some, like, work placements straight out of school, right? So, I went to um, – I, I, tried, I, I tried to, like, give myself two experiences that were very different so I could figure out what I wanted to do, um, like, going forward. So, I went and did the CTV internship um and i quickly realized that wasn't for me it was just a lot of just sitting around and like pushing a button once in a while which wasn't really my my thing and then i <clears throat> the other thing that i did was uh the ontario police video unit and they had like a crew of like three or four guys and they were producing really high end uh stuff like really high end videos um for the opp so I was like, that is what I want to do. So I, as soon as I was done that, I started just sort of, I sort sort of made my own company, but I didn't really know what I was doing. So it was sort of like freelance slash starting my own company and just like, you know, working that way. Um, and then, yeah, since then I've, I've had a full-time job since then I've, I've kind of bounced all over the place, but um, yeah, that's where I started out of school. And Jessica, you started, um, in makeup and then went on transition to on-camera stuff. So what was that? How did you get first get involved with makeup and uh, why did you want to transition over to being on camera? Well, I, I grew up in sort of the performing arts in a way. Um, I loved doing plays. I, lo- I took dance. I loved performing. Um, and all throughout high school, I was pretty involved with like the, the drama stuff. So it was like super popular as you can imagine. Involved um, with drama, <laughs> like drama, acting drama, or a school, high school kid drama? High school drama. No, high acting. Drama. Um, Did you go to Degrassi Hot? <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I always really loved acting, but I've always been sort of like a shy person. So the idea of like pursuing that as a career, I, I put it in sort of the, you know, pipe dream category. and. Another thing that I loved doing was, you can say fucking stuff, right? Are yeah. we allowed to swear? Yeah. Yes. I, I meant to ask you I always, Okay. Um, <laughs> I loved fucking around with makeup. 
and I would like have my friends come over and I do them all up and we do these photo shoots and, and just be creative and have fun. So I got into makeup in um, high school. We had to do a, I did a co-op program and they kept trying to, I said, I wanted to do makeup, but they kept trying to put me in like the Bay beauty section. It's like, that's not that what I want to do. So I ended up seeking out um, a special effects artist in Toronto and I co-opted with a special effects studio and then worked in that for a while. And then when I hit my early twenties, I was kind of like, what am I doing? Time's ticking away. You worked on I really want to act. Worked on some cool movies, by the way, too. Yeah, which only sort of like made me more curious about being on camera because now you're on set and now you're like in the so environment. So what did you work on then? Um, I worked on a film for ABC Disney called Nature of the Beast. I think it was like a straight to TV thing. I never saw it. Um, Silent Hill, uh, the first one that was shot in Toronto. And then um some other ones that i really can't remember the names of resident evil all of them i didn't know i didn't work on those no. i didn't work on the resident Evil, but the studio like Just the guys kidding. that i worked with did the mm-hmm. resident evils yeah so like when you're doing the makeup and you kind of want to make that transition into acting is like is there a way that you can do both like or was it you had to choose well for me i chose flat out because as P.S. When I was said I was working in makeup, I was like, you know, the the trainee or like the apprentice role. So it's not like I'm on set getting to actually apply the makeup. So I'm like assisting the guys. I'm working in the shop. You know, the hours are set hours. So you're doing like 12, 16 hour days sometimes. And it's really grueling at times. And through that, I started getting a little bored of that. And I also happen to have like <laughs> some bad allergies to a lot of the chemicals that we worked with because there's that a lot of be, chemicals. That can't be a great experience. Well, I loved it. I wouldn't change <laughs> it for anything, but I definitely things sort of started pushing me away from it. And then, um, yeah, that's sort of, you know, you, you sort of bottom out a little bit of like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So what am I going to do? So you go to Niagara college for acting so and, then and the second Niagara. year the program is running. Yeah. Oh, you went to the Why Niagara not? college acting program. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's actually how I'm. So we graduated and then the next year just started. Um, yeah. And then for, you probably, the you went back. Is that how you guys met? Is you worked on a project for Niagara together? No, we met through, I went to, I was in the same class as Quinn's younger brother. Yeah. So, so that's we I met was, through Quinn's brother. I was trying to build up. So back circling back to when I, so I, I just started my business and I was looking to get a hot girl to like do a, oh. a little like promo video for me for the business. And uh, my brother, this is pre uh, pre any, any dating app or anything. My brother starts flipping through Facebook of the girls that are uh, in his class. And I was like her. And <laughs> then, you know, then it just started like went from there. We started talking and, um, we never ended up doing that video. No, we never ended up doing that video, Mitch. No. So I don't know. Maybe we'll do that someday. Oh, sneaky play. <laughs> it might so, have been a sneaky play. How long did it take for you guys? Kind of like, cause you have the, uh, you have the Quinn Aiden, um, link three media, uh, personal freelance business and you guys work together. So how long into that relationship where you guys like, Oh, let's partner together and use all of our skills and make this a thing. 10 years. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's recent. So, I mean, uh, f- like from a full-time perspective, it's, it's recent, it's about a year, uh, that we have joined forces full-time, but we just started dabbling on creative projects really early on, like Jess with that stuff she was talking about where she would, um, you know, do photo shoots with her friends when she was in high school. Even when I met her, she was still doing that stuff with her friends, going into the basement of her parents' house and like, putting crazy makeup on and like using the the furnace room with weird pipes and shit everywhere and <laughs> you know getting creative and and I saw like early on how how much of a, an artistic director she could be so I always kind of knew I would try to poach her away from whatever she was doing <laughs> and then uh during covid like the work hours at at the store she was working at um were like dwindling down and she was doing some work for me like in a part time sort of fashion but I was like, quit, get, get the hell out of there. I'm, uh, and I kind of stole her. Um, 
And it's been, it's been amazing uh, having her kind of join because ever since she's joined uh, the quality of the work has gotten so much better. The, the client communication has gotten better, especially on set, as you know, Mitch, like you're, you're out there. Uh, you got so much to worry about when you're like a one man band, you know, you got, you got the lights, you got the camera, you got whatever you're dealing with the clients, you got actors, you got whatever it is. So having someone like Jess there making sure that like, she's like, she's always communicating with the client, figuring out what they want, figuring out like what, like always keeping that end goal in mind, keeping us on schedule. It's, it, it's been, <laughs> it's been amazing to to have her uh, join forces. So, yeah. So, Happy so how do you guys uh, balance um, that, that kind of business orientation? Like, or do you, do you not? Cause like how create, how beneficial um, or not beneficial it sometimes it might be, is it to have someone who's as of creative as you um, professionally and personally? I, I will say it's awesome and terrible at the same time. So when you're both in that groove of creativity, then like when you're in the, you know, the flow of it, it's great because you just kind of carry each other through it and you've got twice the momentum and the ideas flowing and all that, but then it can get hard to turn off the business talk. And then that's where it's like, Oh my God, because you just want to sometimes not talk about work and not talk about a project and just like try to live uh, a, a more regular life, guys, whatever guys, that means. You know? do you guys, have, you, have you guys set up a, like a system where like, you know, if, if there is a, a prudent issue, we're like, all right, well, let's, we'll talk about it for 30 minutes and after that we're done sort of thing. Or is that something you, you've, you're still working on? We're still a good work question. in progress. Yeah, it's a good yeah. question. Like when we, uh, when Jess joined full time, I think I was pretty pumped um, <laughs> to have like uh, someone there alongside like, and that also includes like when a client is being a dink, um, being able to like, you know, like, you know, just get Lament it, get it off your chest. It, yeah. And then I quickly realized like we'd be on, you know, we got two dogs or we have two dogs now, but we'd be on, on a walk with the dog. And I'd just be like, nah, 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 the whole time. <laughs> um, not like always bad stuff, but just like constant business talk and just nip that in the bud pretty early because like, yeah, if you join forces as a couple, um, you could quickly just, everything could be about work. Right. So, um, we and definitely shut it down. Like yeah. when the work is done for the evening, when we, when we take the dogs out for their like afternoon stroll, which is like before dinner for us, um, at the, the, the business talk is kind of done and we kind of just, we cap it there. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm one who needs to not, I need to turn off work. You need I to, can't de- be, you need that decompression from that. Yeah. I need a lot of decompression yeah. time. I need to turn it off. And I think everyone does. I, yeah. I don't think you're unique. I think it's too draining. I you think know, you to could be consumed by work all the time, how, how even many, when yeah. you love it. Jessica, how many baths do you take a week? How many baths? <laughs> yeah. oh, Zero, because we don't have a bathtub, Mitch. Thanks for rubbing it in. <laughs> we don't have a bathtub anymore, which sucks so hard. But if we had a bath, I would probably be taking like three, three I've, to four I've been, baths. I've been getting more into the bathing. Uh, oh. More work I do. It's, it is they're so awesome. good. I miss it. They're the, they're the best, man. I envy everyone who has a bath. Yeah, Epsom salts. And, oh, oh, I miss it. Nice. Oh, and there's a nice. bath yes. bomb in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah bath bombs it's it's soothing it's a stab in my heart if someone gives me a bath bomb and a gift <laughs> stab <laughs> in your I heart what's to do with it it's just an excuse Mom, to book Dad, uh, can i come over and use a bath that's all yeah yeah they don't even have no they either. took their bathtub out <laughs> nah. that's uh, where you just like when you next time you go out for like a date night it's like let's say a hotel room with a nice jacuzzi bath yeah just, just like an we've airbnb done that. just airbnb for the night we've done so that you have a bath We've yeah. done that for sure. We like, especially like after a day of skiing or something, it's just nice to just like hit the bath. Right. So, yeah. Oh, I, uh, I just, uh, I started playing ball hockey again and like that first night just running when you haven't run for so long, your body oh. just hot and beat to shit. And I'm like, I need a bath and like, I need a cold one. So I just did like an ice bath for myself. Ooh, it felt so nice. Good. It's hardcore. Wim Hof. Yeah. Damn man. Good job. Yeah. Did you put ice cubes in it? No, I just put it on super cold. <laughs> That's that's bad enough. That's yeah, bad. I, I did you just get out, or did you fill it with warm after? Uh, so I would take the bath and I would shower warm afterwards because okay, after hockey, like, you need to clean yourself fair. afterwards. I, I mean, yeah, you're married, you're soaking so, in your own. I'm sweat married. You're married. You know you can't go to bed smelly like that's Yeah. That's, <laughs> well, 
Come on now. I, I do. No, I don't. I like try when, not to. When, when, when my <laughs> wife is this, like, where she comes to color and she's like, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> like this, yeah. that's not a, that's not a nice romantic moment that you want to have in your catalog nah. no dude sometimes he'll like Gwen will like put his pillow up beside me and like rest down while I'm like sitting and I'm just like I can smell your stinky hair <laughs> sometimes I sometimes I showered that morning I don't get it I think I have a problem your head stinks <laughs> you need to go shower uh, it's the, usually on the couch I try not to go to bed <laughs> smelling like that uh it's usually, but I, uh, it's it. You mentioned how like as a solo person uh, on shoots, like carrying all that equipment all day long is very taxing on the body, and then you gotta go back and get all the footage. It's, it's like so. Oh, like, yeah. you are working. You're you're almost doing a workout for almost four hours essentially. I I forget that often, um, and then like sometimes I get home. I'm like, why am I so hungry, <laughs> and like why am I so tired? And then it's like, oh yeah, well especially for us here, if we go to the city, we have to drive, like I'm driving between like two to three hours and like throughout that day. And then driving makes me so tired, but yeah. yeah, I, it, I, it, I, well, yeah, yeah. I drive to Sarnia every day. Right. So, I mean, imagine yeah. that back and forth five days a week. Yeah. I mean, goodness. <laughs> what are you doing in Sarnia? Uh, I'm working for uh, Kojiko, uh, your TV. Nice. Cool, man. Yeah, because you were with Kojiko at another place too, right? Before? Uh, no, we did Kojiko at Niagara. We did the incident yeah. at Niagara, remember? Yeah. Uh, no, I was at East Link in Newfoundland. Oh, East Link. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Cool, man. So Are you still wrestling? Is. Yeah, I just finished training, actually. So you got to get those ice baths in after you wrestle. Yeah, no, I, 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 I we did a bias slams today, and I landed right on my hip. So I went to Cairo. I know I changed, came home and uh, took a nice cold bath. Buddy, I can't even, like I was just saying before we started here, like I, a round of golf and my hip is toast and your body slamming. <laughs> I don't know how you, I would be like, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be like, well, totally. Quinn, there comes the saying, never full Mitchie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, I was going to ask you that earlier. Never full Mitchie. When you're wrestling, you have to be full Mitchie, right? No, so when I was in Newfoundland, um, I was West Winchester. I was the mainlander. So I don't know if you know anything about Newfoundland, but they're they are they're an island, right? So they don't really like people from the mainland coming over and I like, try and like telling them what to do. So essentially I was just the bad guy and just would shit on Newfoundland in my promos before every match, and it was fantastic. <laughs> oh that's a good role, man. Nice. Well done. There was one time I was I was cutting a promo and we were in God, I forget where we were, but uh, I was like, oh, you guys got a big soccer community here, blah, blah, blah. Well, where I come from, we call it football, the true, pure name of the sport. And I'm just from Ontario, but they don't know any better. So like, the, ah. crowd, the crowd hated me, hated me. I loved every minute of it. That's so good. Antagonist. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, so back to you guys. <laughs> um, no, back to you. Nah, no, back to you, Jim. Uh, so what like so at what point in your careers did you guys meet and how like Quinn especially with your experience and my experience being similar how much have you learned just from working as opposed to like you know because I, I can be honest with you I barely remember anything from college <laughs> like I've learned most of my stuff just oh, yeah. from working and like doing the work yeah I had to relearn a lot of stuff from YouTube if I'm being fully honest um, because I, I don't know about you, but I am terrible at, at remembering stuff. So like if we had a test, I would just like sit and memorize the things I knew we needed to memorize. And then the next day it would be gone. A lot of it anyway. Um, so, and then, you know, 12 years later, or however long it is, I'm realizing the value of some of those things that we learned that I haven't been implementing, um, enough in, in my work, you know, just stuff like, you know, vector scopes and things that, I was just like, ah, you don't need that unless it's for broadcast. And then, you know, I started implementing it in, in my videos. I'm like, oh my God, this makes color correction so much easier. So like just stuff like that. Um, what was the question again? So, what, 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 oh yeah. What, what have you no, learned since from like how, oh. how much has, you, and same with Jessica, like how much has your, like from doing makeup to acting to now, like um, working with, like, I, doing feel it. Like, I feel like a lot of people put too much um, emphasis on an education as opposed to like, 
you know, just doing and getting the work done. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For me, like I, I've actually struggled a lot with feeling inadequate in a lot of ways because I have jumped around so much. Like I've done so many different things and I'm, it's like the Jack of all trades, master of none. Bullshit saying, you know, way. pardon me. Bullshit saying. I hate that. Saying. Oh yeah. Right. And that's master, the thing. Master like, one can't do anything. It's just yeah. one thing. Like, and that's the thing. like you're, you're, you're brought up with that phrase yeah. and sort of that gets in the back, you know, sort of programmed back there that you're supposed to be really good at one thing. But then the older you get and the more experiences I've had, I've learned to value more how much I have jumped around. So now that like, you know, I've got some experience with photography. I've got experience creative directing. I've got experience in front of the camera and behind the camera. I've been able to, you know, c come up with a shoot idea from nothing, like no concept to seeing it through to the very end. So now that I've had all of these various experiences that I definitely, you know, got pieces of from education, but most of it has been just through trial and error and like real world experience and real life experience. Yeah. The, the same thing applies for me because I, I, that's why I went to college. I think going to like film school and university is like the dumbest thing because you're just learning the theory of it. And it's like, what do you, you know, you got to shoot, you got to get out and do the thing that you want to do. Um, so, and then, you know, to tag on to what, what Jess was saying too, like, we're both people that get kind of bored. I get bored if I'm doing the same thing over and over and over. So yeah, like if you're someone that say as a photographer, you focus only on portrait photography, you're going to get really good at it. You're going to be the master at that. Um, and it's easier to market yourself as well because you have a niche, um, or a niche. <laughs> I had a, I had a teacher in grade four that was said niche. And now I say niche I say and niche. everyone else says niche. So I don't know I what like it the is. the sound of niche better. Um, I just like quiche. Yeah. Quiche. Yeah. We, you have a quiche <laughs> and, uh, it's easier to you market. Have when you have quiche. Quiche. Ah. Yeah. You have ah. niche it's easier to market when you have a good quiche <laughs> and, but so that makes it di more difficult, honestly, for us, because we are the jack of all trades and it's like, okay, so then what do you want to focus on? Like really what you end up doing is trying to focus on the thing that you like doing the most versus the thing that is making you the most money. Cause it's, it's easy to go down that road of like, well, portrait photography is making us bank right now. But if I really don't like doing it, then or why, you know you're what are you get doing? Bored of it fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then yeah. Do you really want to tie yourself to that? Yeah. One so thing? how, how do you, how do you guys balance that? Like, uh, professionalism and that creativity is that kind of why you guys started uh, your band Feed Wolves so you'd have like that control over something creative um well yes and no Feed Wolves is more just to fulfill another side of the creativity that the other stuff doesn't fulfill so music has always been really really important to me um it's probably one of my if I had to make a list of my favorite creative things music is probably at the top um, but as a money-making venture, and we're still relatively like new to producing and writing and the whole thing. Um, so we can't you know, rely on that at all to make any sort of, um, income off of yet anyway, but it just fulfills that side of the creativity that I think is very important to me. And I think you would agree. There's some importance to it to you as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other stuff is just another version of storytelling. Like when you break it all down, it's all just different forms of storytelling in a way. So we get to tell stories then through photos, through video, and that actually we can make a living off of. Yeah. Um, the Feed Wolves thing is it, the music is more of a passion project, really. Yeah. Um, there's no expectation, and which is nice. Not having an expectation to make any money from it is kind of a nice thing. Um, there's, yeah, there's no, uh, no expectation there. And it's really a, a complete creative freedom. Um, so having that complete freedom, cause it's only us, we have no, we have no client to answer to. We have none of that stuff. So having that, that freedom to do whatever we want and, and we have no label or anything, anyone to, you know, run anything by. Right. So it's just nice that we can be fully just ourselves with that. So it's a nice creative project for that. And having that 
that creative outlet and that control over that one, does that help you in your production side of things, like professionally, like being able to do that surrogate, is that kind of like your therapy almost? I would say yes, because like Quinn said, to tag on to that, like being able to be sort of so free and music is very, um, it's so good at like letting you dive into areas of yourself when you're like, Especially, whether you're writing the music or whether you're writing the words. I'm going to say lyrics, writing, yeah, writing be, lyrics for you is, is therapeutic. It can right? be very therapeutic. It's probably, as and, as, it's probably just as therapeutic as like writing in, in a journal or something like that, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Except this time sure. you're, you, the goal, the, the end goal would be to actually release it. So that part can yeah. be really like, we've had some, it's scary sometimes, like when it's your words that you've written, that feels very sort of personal to you. And then you have to like put so it out there. It can be a little vulnerable. It can feel like. very vulnerable. But Especially that's like, at first. a healthy practice. Yeah. So you mentioned how scary it is, but be honest how much fun is that fear oh it's wicked fun it's so it feels so rewarding to like face that fear where you know there's like some fears where it's you're afraid to do it and then you do it you're kind of like yeah i'm still scared to do that that didn't feel that great that didn't feel like that went that well but with music even down to performing i have terrible performance anxiety with music um there's something very rewarding about accomplishing it. Uh, even if it doesn't go great. Yeah, you, you just kind of <laughs> still feels good. You after. leave there feeling like I did it, even though my body and my <laughs> brain and everything was telling me not to, and everything was yeah. telling me to run, get the fuck out of that place. <laughs> and like, like or a, don't release the song, you know, like all the alarms of you're not safe. You're not safe. Too vulnerable. And but, just yeah. like going and doing it. And I like back to you, Mitch. <laughs> about like you, but you, you, you do stuff that is scary too. You know, you, you dive into stuff that you have a passion for that's scary, like wrestling, like stand up, all that stuff. It it's, it's hard. It's hard to do that stuff. But as you know, it's super rewarding when you push through that fear of anything, I think. What was it? I was, I was listening to, I think it was a podcast and they were asking like, they're talking about anxiety and the best way to get over anxiety is to just, do stuff that you're afraid of and that anxiety will go away <laughs> super quickly. And I, I, yeah. I, I truly believe that's an excellent, cause like, I mean, there's certain things that like being on stage and performing uh, music, music, comedy, like that's scary, but like, that's not life threatening. Like you're not gonna no. like, but you, then there's other things where like jumping out of a plane, doing parachuting, uh, you know, bungee <laughs> jump. Th those are different things. But like, if you want to do something like a performance art, every time I'm just like, just, fucking do it guys like, it's not the if you do it and you fail you, at least you can say you did it and you have a good cool story to tell <laughs> yeah well yeah. that's the funny thing is that you bring that up because the the anxiety of like it's not life-threatening and yet your body is responding as if it were so you have to sort of mentally override your physiological response that's saying you're in danger. Like there's a tiger in the bush, even though it's clearly there, you know, you're safe. It's not even a bush, but your body is responding as if it's the same level of like danger. But at least we have the rational mind that can sort of be like, you're actually, <laughs> and to be, and, no and, tiger. and to your point, like, I think that's probably why you see a lot of comedians, uh, musicians, like that's why they dabble in drugs alcohol like i mean this because mm -hmm. like that's that is a huge coping mechanism for a lot of those artists oh like, yeah like, yeah like if sure. i don't have if i don't have like a beer or two to kind of like loosen up before i hit the stage it's usually gonna be a train wreck yeah same yeah same yeah. I usually have <laughs> we do the same a drink or two before yeah. we have to get up and yeah. like we before the pandemic and everything shut down we were doing open mics and stuff fairly regularly and we got to like play a show for a, a local musician and open up for her and her band and stuff. And that was one of the scariest things we I've were probably hammered. ever no, done. No, I've ever done in my life, but even through all these little performances and we were going to open mics pretty regularly before that show to sort of help prepare us for the more high pressure like gig. And I would say that my performance anxiety went down but it didn't go away. It didn't disappear. I just got more confident in knowing that I could sing and play through the anxiety. So it's like not the fear of having a panic attack on stage and not being able to perform that fear started to diminish. Cause you knew you could 
I knew I could, could sing through it. Sing I could through perform it. through it. I, I, and so there the were, nerves were going to be there, but I could do, I, we could still get through it. So yeah. I gained confidence there, but the anxiety did go away. <laughs> and there were micro progressions there. Yeah. So it's just like a matter of doing it more and more and more and more. Yeah. Now, I think it's important to note that like, you know, having a few drinks for a set is great. I tried going up high as fuck the one time doing comedy. That was so scary. forgettable. What <laughs> I are you everything doing? I wanted to say. I think I had to do five minutes. Dude, I'm like, and I was like, ah, two minutes. I'm done, guys. Thanks. I blah blah blah. <laughs> That's, That's what so I would scary. do. I can't remember shit when I'm not high. <laughs> uh, like I would re- forget all of the jokes. I I can't believe that when I hear comedians do that, I'm like, how? I guess it's so like drilled in that they just don't forget shit. But, drilled in, but like if you. If you know it's a comedy special and there's usually like a speaker in the center of the stage, there's usually like a pad of paper or a note with like their oh, true. bullet points mm. and stuff like that. That's true. Like so if, I do, you, if I do a five minute set, I'll write down the bullet points of the joke on my hand just so I don't forget. Right. I would have to do that too. Um, but that would give me, yeah, I wouldn't be good with being high and doing that. I don't think I could do do that playing music either. I mean, actually to that note, I actually get stoned when we jam when we practice because it forces me to like it almost puts me into like a performance state because i don't remember shit as well when i'm high so i'll like forget chords and i'll have to like think on my feet a little bit so it kind of helps me get into more of the performance mode which i don't know if that's counterintuitive um but <laughs> you're just you're throwing an obstacle in your way i'm throwing an obstacle in while we're thing. practicing yeah, it's uh, fucking <laughs> quinn's just pretending it's american gladiators and he's the guy trying to that's right yeah. <laughs> that's right my life is american gladiators i constantly have the theme song playing in my head <laughs> so how beneficial is it to i think we might have t- touched on it before but with those anxieties about performing and probably even the anxiety that you have while on a, on a shoot day, how beneficial is it to have someone to go to and decompress with that knows what you're going through? It's very important for me anyway, because it just like, not even just Quinn, but like when you read about, you know, famous, extremely successful artists who talk openly about performance anxiety, it just helps you to feel like, okay, it's not just because I'm so amateur or it's not just me. Like it just helps you to feel not so alone. And then on the personal level to be able to like assess your, like I'm my hardest critic. We all are. Right. So if I get off from you know, off the stage after a little performance. And I was like, oh my God, I fucked up so bad. That was terrible. He can be more objective and help to be like, actually, no, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> you know, yeah, we made some bubs here, or whatever, but it wasn't bubs. terrible. So it's it's helpful to have someone to share the experience with and who understands and who's right there with you during the thing. Um yeah, yeah. it's very it's I would say it's it's very helpful. Like I I haven't really gone up there alone, to be honest. I've yes, only you been did. Oh, yes, I did. did. I did yes, one time. Did. I did an open mic once. I think you went up twice. Um, maybe twice, but oh, I, I, yeah. I it, for a show like when that when that when we did that little opener for uh, in town, it was like that's n- not a big deal to most musicians. Like that's like a piece of cake, but for us, that was the biggest crowd we've ever played in front of. Yeah. And it was like a stage and yeah, you know, and it was, was intense. And how cool is it that you actually got up and did it? And you can always tell that story at a dinner party, at a wedding, Definitely. wherever the fuck you are, sort of thing. Well, even yeah. to my own yeah. brain, when if I'm getting hard on myself for something, I can always just remind True. myself of like a year ago, you would have thrown up just at the thought of doing that and you did it. So shut up. Like, that's yeah. what I get to tell my brain. Yeah. Like going off on the me. first, <laughs> before we even did an open mic, Jess had some pretty crippling anxiety. Like about, crippling. So we walked into um, one of the open mics. We didn't have a, our guitar. We didn't plan on playing at all. Yeah. We didn't play, but we sat there and even just walking in there, Jess was getting anxiety. Like just heart with, the idea, with the thought of <laughs> yeah. having to do it herself. Yeah. Um, so going from that and then within less than a year, you know, it's like six months, from six, like six first, months yeah. playing, uh, like opening for a band, um, that was, that's pretty good. So 
um, it just goes to show like, you know, like you said, you kind of just push through it. The more you can push through the fear, um, you know, you're, you're gonna, it's, it, it's slow, but you're going to get better. Yeah. So in, in speaking of that, like your, your artist in both like your professional lives as well as your personal lives, I've been having a real struggling, uh, with like doing freelance on the side and like defer- determining my worth sort of thing. So how have you guys been able to determine your worth in terms of like, you know, doing these freelance projects and being artists yourselves. That's hard. That's still a struggle, especially yeah. speak to just myself and my own like visual art, like my paintings and drawings and stuff. Or even if I'm like creating album art for someone or designing stuff, I still really struggle with charging appropriately, especially because, um, you know, if I haven't been doing something that long, I tend to rationalize my worth that way. And how I'm long like, have and, I been doing and, it? And not to, but like, to your point though, like I've seen artists who are not good. <laughs> they charge astronomical prices. So like right. having that out there in the, in the universe and like, it, it's a mind fuck. <laughs> I wish I had that confidence. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck it. This is what I'm charging. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been, I'm still working on that personally uh with my own side stuff that i do but with like our business quinn has 15 12 years experience. 12 years whenever we graduated 12 years i think at this point but uh, 2009 we 2009 i always thought we graduated yeah. 2010 to be honest <laughs> maybe it was shit i don't know uh no, I, I work years. with i work with scott uh, anderson he uh, he oh was, uh, okay cool so nice. He was telling. Apparently, it's it is 2009. But I I count okay. 2010. I count two. I, I don't them. count. I don't count college as experience. Um, I count no. the day. The, I count the day I started working on a cruise ship as like my first professional day. Yeah, that was definitely that was a fucking whirlwind day. Holy shit! It's like here's a camera. Go. What the fuck <laughs> do you want me to do again? Shoot people. <laughs> Doing what? What do you want me to shoot? Doing Having fun. <laughs> It was insane because you got the flight in hotel and then you join the ship. It's this giant 5,000 pounds. Crazy, man. Thing. You walk in and you're like small white town kid from King Carter, Ontario. And he's like, I don't know that language. I don't know that language. I don't know that language. That person, that, where, there's so many different colors here. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> and yeah. That's so cool. Camera. You're just giving so a fucking cool. camera and you go. It's what like, a great experience, man. Mm-hmm. And, and you got to shoot so much that you, like, I could see your skill developing, like, as the years went by it with the stuff you were posting, like, yeah, you, you just got to shoot so much. And that's the same thing as like performance and, anxiety, the more you practice. Right. And it's not only like that, like I got to shoot a lot, but I also got to like, um, bounce ideas off of other videographers that yeah. I met over the course of years. So like in terms of like yeah. what you guys do, how often do you bounce ideas off? Not just each other, but like, do you have a group of people that you're creative with that you, that you work together and kind of bounce ideas off of or, um, we do like, we've got a couple of people that we sort of work with, um, that I've sort of met through different, well, actually I met two, two of the main guys I met at the same job that my, my full-time job that I had at the Toronto stock exchange and they were freelancers. And then you kind of just get an idea of like, oh yeah, we can work well together. Like this is a good, we could, we could work. And, and they're obviously talented too. That's important. Um, but in terms of like, so we, we would bring in and collaborate that way, but mostly they're just kind of like second shooters. So we actually do a lot of the sort of that work ourselves. Well, and um, I will say though, Quinn's best friend, um, is a real, oh, you say like, say like a cinephile. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we actually will bounce ideas off of him frequently. So even though he's not working in the industry per se, um, he has a lot of knowledge about it. He did go to school and study film and stuff. And he's just like watches every movie and really studies them. So he's a great yeah. resource for bouncing ideas off of as well. And I want to bounce back to your, your question about the self-worth thing and, and, and that stuff. I, I think um, my big thing that I've been trying, that I've been wrestling with for a really long time is allowing myself to do creative projects. Um, because what I always do is I hide behind other people's sort of projects and and their sort of needs. So 
forever I've been hiding, been afraid to be a filmmaker. I've been afraid to like tell my own stories, tell, you know, my own like documentary stories, like stuff like that, because it's more vulnerable. I've been hiding behind the, the clients. Um, so the music stuff has been a really good like exercise in like getting my own shit out there, our own shit out there. And then lately what I've like recently we connected with, uh, actually he's the guy that went. So we have a dog that we rescued. He's from Northern Manitoba. And he's the guy that actually drove to Northern Manitoba and got him from the reservation and brought him back to Ontario. So we're going to sort of tell his story and, and interview him and, and make a little mini doc. That's the kind of stuff that I've been like telling myself I need to do for a really long time. And I've just been like, either I, I can, you know, lie to myself and say I'm too busy. Like I, there's just a million excuses, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it's like, it's a passion project. So it's not going to make any money. That's it. You got to make sure you got to have the time for it. But then it's also the vulnerability of like, yeah. you know, making your own. But when it comes to self self worth and, and trying to convey to others that look at what I can do, this is what I want to do. And this is like, these are my, these are my skills. But if you're just constantly doing work that you don't really want to be doing, you're never going to be able to show that to people. Um, well, I mean, did you see my post the other day on Instagram? I don't, I don't frequent the, the, the okay. gram. So, so like I was, I was doing a shoot for a uh, coach co. Right. And we're doing the show. It's called women who lead. Uh, and it's about women in business that own their own business. That sort of thing. And like I was having a week and I, I took this picture and I'm like, I should just be doing this freelance. I should not, like, I, it's great that I got this job and everything, but I mean, like, it's, like I'm, I'm, I'm borderline, like same thing with you struggling with like, maybe I should just start doing more projects that are freelance and fun to do and maybe try and sell those show ideas as opposed to like, giving it to a company that's paying me X amount a year. Yeah. Sort of thing. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that's sort of like, I've always like, I do have the experience. I have the experience there. I did that thing. Like I did what you're doing right now. I decided at some point I want to try to do the full-time thing. I want to get the experience, you know, it was kind of cool. I got to travel across Canada and and do cool things, but just like you did uh, with the cruise ships and stuff like that. But I learned that it's just not, it wasn't fulfilling for me. So, and then you, you, you kind of keep taking it a step further. You keep progressing and you keep growing. So if I just said, okay, I'm going to quit that job and I'm going to start my, like, go back to running my own business and and working with my own clients. And I just ended it there. Then I wouldn't be forcing myself to like take the initiative to make this little mini doc. And I wouldn't be growing still in the areas that I want to grow. So I've done, I've gotten to the point where I wanted to be. And then I sat there a little too comfortable for a couple of years. And now I'm ready to sort of, it's, I, I'm push I'm, yourself. Yeah. I'm getting bored of that now. So now I'm ready to, to push you, again. So like, do you feel it's important to have goals or do you think you're better suited to kind of just play it by ear and like kind of let the, 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 the puzzle pieces land where they're supposed to land? That's a good question. I, what, do you, what do you think? I think yes. And like, I think yes, <laughs> goals, it's important to have goals, goals and? because as I think it's just a, hu- a human nature thing to think of the future and to plan for the future and to want to feel the satisfaction of accomplishment. But if that's all you have is constantly like one thing after the next, you kind of miss the present moment, you know, yeah. you miss enjoying what's happening now if you're constantly focused on future goals. But I think it's like goals within reason, things to work towards where it's like the micro progressions that keep you growing. So I think that's the other nature of it is, is our, we want to stay comfortable, but being comfortable all the time, I think at least for me and I know for Quinn and I think for a lot of artists or artistically minded people, comfortable gets boring. And then you start to feel that like lack of fulfillment. I've felt, you know, sometimes I feel like, like so almost like dead inside because I've gotten so comfortable. It's like, why am I so blue? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cause dumb, dumb, you're not pushing yourself and growing. That's right? what I was going to say. Growing. And, it's... and, and to, to, to your point, that's why I do the comedy. That's why I do the wrestling. Cause like, yeah, I don't push that is no matter like, 
no matter how my like career will go, like that's still to be determined. Like I'll still have those avenues of both various uh, uh, creativity that I can uh, play off of. Yeah, that where you're you're pushing yeah. yourself and you're forcing yourself to grow, and that will only feed into everything else you do. It. Like yeah. That. So pushing yourself yeah. in those areas feeds into the your career, but also you can't forget to keep pushing yourself in in your you know videos and filmmaking and whatever whatever that is as well because that's one thing that i've definitely excuse me learned over the years is the 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 second that i stop pushing myself that's when i start to lose the love for whatever that thing is so i've lost the love for photography i've lost the love for video i've lost the love for basic pretty much like any creative thing i've lost the love for it in the past at and it's point, always yeah. yeah and at some point it's always when i stop pushing myself because i mean once you get good at something it's hard not to just like do the formula that you know works right yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. but it's real hard but not it, to stay with that formula and it's like yeah. even if you know it's boring you can just keep doing it um because it's working but um yeah i i just like i know that it's sometimes it's not immediate either. Like it'll be like a few months and then I'm like, Oh man, I'm stuck in a rut with this stuff. Like, I don't feel like doing any of this. Like, I don't feel like doing any of these videos. I don't feel like doing any of these photo shoots. And then I realize, Oh yeah, it's because like, I'm not pushing myself. Even if those, even if I at least do the paid work and the client work and just treat that as work, but at least if I'm doing other stuff, pushing myself in other projects outside of that, then it still, it, it still makes it like, I just, I come back to loving that thing again. Yeah. It fulfills that side that needs the challenge. Like that needs that. So in, in, ta in talking about challenges and talking about, you know, uh, goals, I mean, what are some of the challenges that you hope to have in the future with goals that you might have now? challenges we hope to have yeah you want challenges I'll, I'll throw it out there in terms of like it like you want to do this documentary film right but like have you thought about you know doing a scripted like if you have any writer's friends they've always they have ever, ever had a script would you want to take someone's script and produce an actual film like, like a narrative thing or something yeah like that's definitely a goal, I think, for me. I mean, you, uh, have, a, like, you have a star actress already. So, I mean, that's I do. Fun. Star oh. actress. Myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think... It's like, just a fucking know, movie of Quinn selfies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's exciting. Um, and I'll shoot it. And you'll shoot be, it. Yeah. Perfect. It's, it's backwards. Yeah. Very uh, artistically bad. Yeah. Let me monochrome perfect. this so we can get nice black and white. Meta. Things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. That's all. Terrible she's all camera about work, but on purpose. So, <laughs> so I can't tell if it's a porn or an action scene. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, back to the, the, the thing about having goals. Like, yeah, I do. I have long term goals, but I don't have like the immediate sort of like plan for those. Um, but it's one, one project at a time, one step at a time. So yeah. And I'll, just to, sorry, cut you off. Um, yeah, you did. it seems to, <laughs> to go that way with us where it's like, okay, first goal, like to, to use music as an example, do an open mic. Okay. Check. Did the open mic next goal, play a little show, did that check next goal, write more songs and then release one. And then it's like, check. So then each one each one you stack on you start getting more and more ambitious of going up the ladder like so it keeps taking you up the ladder so maybe the first goal will be to make the little mini doc and then harder narrative so then go up the ladder and i think that's part of it is like to never yeah. stop growing the ladder the ladder analogy is, is a good one um because you yeah it's just steps and you do have to work your way up there right so you know to, like, I'd love to do a full feature doc right now. I'd love for someone to come and be like, Hey, I want to hire you to do a full feature doc. I have the confidence that I could do it, but it would be better if I actually did this mini doc first. I mean, I've done little mini, mini little spotlight things before, but doing like a mini doc first before doing a full one is probably an important step. Just like for the music, creating one song before creating a full album is probably an important step because you can't have an album without <laughs> and i At think it's great song. that you guys have that freedom because like with the job i have now like everything i create they kind of own right so i want to like the idea of being able to like, right. have your own stuff so you can put it as, and 
so people can see it is I think the most important mm-hmm. thing. Like, I mean, I think you you talk about it in right. your uh, your website where it's like, you know, YouTube is number one or number two streaming service in the world. Like just it's the number two quality. search, search engine, it's number two well, search engine. I mean, yeah. there you go. And, but like the idea is like, I think a lot of people are misinterpreting this idea of like owning content as opposed to like just giving content out. Like, I mean, if you look at someone like Joe Rogan, I mean, he gave all his shit away for free and now he's got a hundred million and he still gives it away for free. I mean, yeah. I think that's a, I, I don't think that people will actually realize, you know, that, you know, the idea of like showing people the stuff that you create, it helps you um, professionally and personally, I think, in my opinion. Uh, absolutely. And also it's to your point, like you're sharing your art or, mm-hmm. and whether it's art, whether you call it art or whether you call it whatever it is, but like Don Henley drives me nuts. He's such a dick because he <laughs> won't like all, like he's a, like one of the last people that's holding out on Spotify and all the streaming. He, like you can't get his music because he doesn't want to make it public that way. He wants people to have to purchase it. And it's like, you're, you made your art, but you're hoarding your art. So, you know, not only is it important, I think personally to share it for yourself as an artist, but also like, why are you going to make art? And then just like, keep it to yourself. Like that, that doesn't, I, I think that you should, you should share it. It's obviously it's difficult to share it. And in his case, it's all about money. It's not about, Oh, I'm afraid to share my art. And I think it's, that's, it's, I think that's scary is when money become, when money becomes the main motivation behind art. Oh, yeah. it's so toxic. And that's one of the best things about having the side passion projects because you're not beholden to anyone. It's only yourself and your own internal integrity that you have to sort of hold your, you know, hold your standards up to. So that I think is a really good exercise in maintaining that level of artistic integrity because you're not, there's no money involved you're not trying to make a living. You don't have to pay your rent off of it. So anytime that we've learned this the hard way, I would say, but anytime that we have the free time to do the passion projects, do the fucking passion projects because it just helps you keep that muscle, that artistic freedom and integrity intact and keeps it active. So then that can also feed into the paid work. And it yeah. feels um, like for you, Mitch, too, like I would say, it, I know like you come home from work, whatever, you're, you're probably tired. You don't really feel like t- picking up a camera. Um, you don't feel like getting and editing some another video, whatever. But I find that unless I'm dog tired, obviously, and there's different, it, you go through different periods or whatever, but oftentimes the passion projects don't really feel like work. And, and often I feel like, uh, it's going to feel like work. You know, I, I get into, I, I have the yeah. idea. I'm like, it feels too daunting because it, it feels like I'm just going to be doing more work that I'm already doing all day, but it doesn't have that same, even if it's like a video, like we recently did a little fitness video for a client and I really got to use some more sort of cine, cinematic sort of looks and stuff. Um, and like, it was a really cool edit and even that got me pumped up. So yeah. something that's more in line with the kind of work that you want to do feels less like work. So you may feel like you don't have the time to do it or the energy to do it, but then you sit there or you go and film it and you're like, Oh yeah, like this feels good. Yeah. Well, in, in, in that, uh, in that frame of mind, I mean, that's what the podcast is all about. It's like talking I like talking to my friends and I have lots of interesting friends and hopefully I can be able to make friends who are interesting and talk to them again, sort of thing. So uh, I, we've been talking for an, an hour now. <laughs> so Damn. I'll let you guys. Nice, go. bro. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so where, Wicked, can people, dude. where can people find you guys on uh, your social medias and stuff? Jess, go ahead. Um, you can find me at Jessica underscore Jean underscore art on Instagram. And is it J, how do I say Jean or how do you spell Jean? J, like jeans, like blue jeans. J. Okay, not Jean as in Jean Wilder or anything like that. No, for some reason, ah, my jeans change it. is jeans. <laughs> I like that one better. I, uh, <laughs> it's blue jeans. Uh, and is, is there anywhere else? Uh, you, oh, we're, we're in the process of uh, getting Jess's website revamped. So yes, um, that right. once that's ready, it'll be posted on her mm-hmm. Instagram. 
And then and also you feed have, wolves. Oh, yeah. yeah. You are, so wolves. you have uh, Quinn Aiden, uh, Link, Link 3 Media as well, uh, website, right? Yeah. You have your Instagram. The main thing... The main thing is Quinn Aiden, so it's just at Q U I N N A D E N. Um, I'm on TikTok too, doing like little tip videos and stuff. Um, and yeah, most of our work we share on on uh, Instagram, like just like little uh, projects we, we've done and, and photo shoots and stuff like that. Um, and then QuinnAiden.com. That's a, a lot of our sort of portfolio is up there, and and you can obviously contact us to, you know book something or inquire about something or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's scripted, uh, commercial promo, whatever. doesn't matter. Uh, I wanted to cut you off for uh feed wolves because I wanted to end with a song. Uh, I want to end the podcast with a song. So nice. what's, uh, what song would you guys like me to play at the end of this podcast? Do you want to say, uh, the river, the river go. Yeah. Type in the river, uh, feed wolves on YouTube. And that should, uh, pop up. That was our first uh, release. And, it's the one that has a music video to it, so that's a little bit better. Oh, yeah, no, I'll rip the music video off YouTube and put it on the end of this video as well. well that's Same. not legal. <laughs> I told you. Don I Henley do it, doesn't like that, bitch. <laughs> Who the fuck is Don Henley? Uh, he's the lead singer of the Eagles. Yeah, the yeah. Eagles suck anyway. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> were you the? Is it, are there the guys Lebowski? that did the, the song for Space Jam? I want to fly away, right? Oh no, who is that? I don't even know. Oh, uh, oh, Steve Miller band. Close, oh, that's Mitch. One. That's close. One Very close. They Very both close. got fucking the same almost album cover, I think, pretty sure. Oh yeah. They're just uh, old white dudes. They all they're all the same. And one day we'll uh, be those old white dudes. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be more inclined to, you know, uh be friendly. Not be racist. <laughs> yeah, not be racist. Listen, no, I'm working on a joke where I, I truly believe everyone's at least three percent racist. Everyone's three percent. Because if you grew up watching any movie, maybe more. Like, well, three three percent is the minimum, which means you're not that bad. Like I'm three. My wife's like six. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like but the she, smaller the but town from, that you come from, the higher no, but the number. No, no, no. But she's from South America, and like their their racism is different than ours. Oh, like, different. Hers is, uh, towards, uh, hers is towards Peruvians. Like there's oh, a conflict between right. Peru and Chile, right? Right. And it's so, like Italians uh, and the French. Yeah. Like, at the yeah, same get time, my, 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 my level of racism can go up from 3% to probably 10%, depending on the situation. Um, yeah. I think, I think we, everyone needs to stop. I think that's fair. Because like, if you grew up with the films that we grew up in, we grew up with, you know, black guys are the bad guys, Russians are the bad guys. <laughs> like we, those, those were the things that grew, it's hard to, like let that stuff go. So you're always going to have that little thing. As the stereotypes. Oh yeah, yeah. We're, we're programmed. We're a stereotype we're society, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. see, the, and, and to elaborate on that, like I worked on cruise ships. I saw all the stereotypes. I saw yeah. them all. And even yeah. ones that we didn't even know existed, but I saw them all. And you filmed them. Uh, no, I, I <laughs> you got it on tape. As they, as they complained about the photographs being too expensive and all this other bullshit. Yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. who you're talking about. I think you should wrap this podcast up right now. I'm talking about you, Quinn, you white bastard. Hey, <laughs> I bought you a coffee at some point. I'm sure. I think we've had a few beers to be honest. I think so. All I right. Think so, uh, Jess. Quinn, oh, it thanks. was those. It was those. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but those Ar Arnold Palmer's man. Remember those uh, on the course? Yeah, it was like we the experimented yeah. one night, didn't we? Those were good. Those were good. We'll end it there. We'll end it there. Uh, Mitch, uh, this is fun, dude. For Arnold Palmer, uh, if you guys have not tried, <laughs> yeah. reach out to sponsor. Yeah, we'll take some. Um, hey, man, we'd love to do this again down the road. Uh, it's fun talking about art and stuff. So uh, I know, yeah. right? And that's why I, I like this podcast because I mean, um, I've had a few comedians on. I've had a tattoo artist on. I've had uh, wrestlers cool. on. Uh, I just talked to a guy named. Um, Elden, who does like fast nine movies and stuff like that like i've mentioned that to you and everything so that's kind of an cool. editor yeah yeah so um we're gonna keep this thing going and uh next on top tomorrow i'm talking to my friend uh mark who owns a brewery in uh, newfoundland amazing oh. so yeah, it's cool because it's not yet wow awesome man and it's not the, just the traditional beer. art you're talking to all brewmasters creatives and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's like, too. everything is a little bit everything 
like anything that can be creative in that sense. I mean, unless you were yep. like, I don't know, I don't know if you, you know, actually, you probably could make a call center job creative depending on who, you, how you want to talk to them. Like, oh, this call, I'm going to do a voice or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's the different, like <laughs> everything can be creative, but the difference between making it art or just like a creative act, I think is an art form in itself. And it's all about, you know, yeah. your, your presence and your intention Agreed. and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. you can be a cook or you can be a chef, Ooh. you know, like. <laughs> or you can, you really can just order good food or HelloFresh and pretend to be both. <laughs> right. There you go. That's fair. Whatever floats your boat, Mitchie. I may not have three good food things in my fridge right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsor me. <laughs> yeah. Hello. You'll get there. You'll get there. Yeah. All right, Jessica. You'll get there, Thank buddy. you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank hey, buddy. It nice to nice to chat with you, buddy. You nice to meet you. you. Yes.
Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode with uh, Jessica and Quinn. Uh, if you want to follow them, uh, Quinn at Quinn Aiden and at Jessica underscore Jean, J-E-A-N underscore Marie on Instagram is where you can find uh, their uh, social medias if you want to get a hold of them or ask them any advice on uh, video or artistic things. Uh, they also have a YouTube uh, subscription page for their uh, band Feed Wolves, which is uh, Feed Wolves on YouTube. So I recommend you guys check it out. Um, that's it for me today. I hope you guys had a great time uh, with the episode this week. Again, you can follow me again at NeverFullMitchy on Instagram and Twitter. Um, all my stuff should be there to my link tree so you can check out all my videos I've done I post on YouTube and stuff like that so it feels weird to shamelessly promote myself but I've been told that I need to do that a little bit more so I'm going to do that now at the end and then we'll leave you guys hanging have a great week, have a great day have a great uh, whatever you're doing uh, and cheers